All right, this is group one of your evolution vocabulary words, um, and we're starting out with endosymbiotic theory. And the endosymbiotic theory pretty much started out when we realized that organelles like mitochondria, um, and mitochondria are kind of shaped like a bean with these layers inside, they actually have their own DNA, RNA, and ribosomes which is pretty much everything you need to make protein, everything that you need to be able to survive. And so scientists started thinking, well, maybe the reason that they have all of those things is because at one point in time, they were um, alive on their own outside of a cell. And so maybe mitochondria were floating around on their own, and a bigger cell came and engulfed them, and that gave us a cell with a little mitochondria living inside of it. Um, and over time, that cell reproduced, and when it reproduced, it reproduced with the mitochondria inside of it. And so the way that we go from these very simple prokaryotic cells to our complex eukaryotic cells that we have today, um, one of the theories is that we got there by these bigger cells engulfing smaller cells, and that's the endosymbiotic theory. The next one we're going to look at is embryology, and embryology is um, basically looking at embryos of different animals and saying at very early stages of development, they all look pretty much the same. So they all kind of have this tail shape with a big eye, kind of like this. Um, and so this one might grow up to become a chicken. This one might grow up to become a human. But at early stages of development, they all look pretty much the same. And that tells us that we probably have a common ancestor. The other peculiar thing is that at this early stage of development, we all have gill slits, um, which we don't need. It's not, it's not so that we can um, breathe in the womb, because there's no need for a embryo to be able to breathe, it gets oxygen from its mother's blood. And so there's an idea that maybe the reason that we have gill slits is because somewhere along the line we have a common ancestor with a fish. And fish have gills. <clears throat> All right, the next one we're going to look at is homology or homologous structures. And homologous structures are um, things like our hand compared with a whale's flipper if you look at them, at first they seem very different. If this is a human hand compared with a whale's flipper, they seem very different. But if you look at the bones inside of them, there's actually a lot of similarities. And you can pick out a similar bone structure inside both of those. So because we have um, similar structures, homo means the same. And so we basically have the same structure. That means that we must have come from a common ancestor. The next one we're going to look at is the Miller-Urey experiment. And what the Miller-Urey experiment did um, is they took uh, basically a flask and they filled it up with all the things that they thought would have been present in prehistoric Earth. So they put some elements in there, like carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and some other things. And they shocked it with some electricity, which they figured would simulate kind of a lightning storm in prehistoric Earth. And they put a cork on it so that nothing could escape. <clears throat> And then over time, they noticed that it started to change color. And so the color change showed them that something was being formed. And the thing that was being formed were amino acids. And those amino acids basically came from the combination of all of these elements. So what the Miller-Urey experiment shows us is that you can take simple things and make more complex things. It doesn't necessarily show how life was created, but it does show that you can go from very simple elements to more complex amino acids. Now we're going to look... <clears throat> now we're going to look at natural selection. And natural selection... 
basically says that traits that are favorable are going to become more common over time and traits that are unfavorable are going to become less common over time. Um, so let's say that you're a lizard and, it, and you live in the rainforest. So here's my attempt at a lizard with a tail. Um, and your species is either going to be green or orange. So here's the orange version of that lizard. Now in the rainforest, you want to bl blend in with all of the trees. And so the green lizard is going to have an advantage because it can blend in with the leaves of the foliage. And so when it's on a leaf, it can't be seen. And that orange lizard is going to get eaten very quickly by predators. And so over time, the favorable trait the camouflage trait is going to become more common and the unfavorable trait is going to become less common. And that's what natural selection says. So now let's look at common ancestor. Common ancestor is a single relative from whom two individuals inherit a similar trait. And so basically it's tracing back a family tree in a way um, because you're going to start out with some organism. We'll that organism here. And over time, it's going to have some offspring, and its offspring are going to have some offspring, and it's going to branch off in all directions, and eventually produce new species. So over here we might have a human, and over here we might have a chimp. Now the human didn't come from the chimp, um, and the chimp didn't come from the human, they both came from this common ancestor, which would be some kind of a combination of the two, because they this common ancestor gave some of its traits to the chimp and some of its traits to the human. <clears throat> so that's the idea of a common ancestor. Now we're going to look at the word adaptation. An adaptation is going to be a favorable trait. It's a trait that will help an organism survive. So we can return to the idea of our lizard that needs to be able to be camouflaged. Um, <clears throat> the point at which the green lizard uh, first appeared when you went from being some other color to being green, we would call that green color the adaptation. So it adapted to its environment in a way. It wasn't its choice to become green, but the fact that it happened to be green based on its genetic makeup was advantageous to it, and so it survived and reproduced to produce more green lizards. And that trait got passed on. So